I'm Alberto Weinstein from Belo Horizonte. We have the honor here to have Professor Daniel Cote. That is one of the most important person in the world in the field of melanoma. He is in a very important position in many organizations, like he's the president of SSO, the NCCN, and also the head of melanoma unit at Memorial Catherine Sloan Cancer Center. I believe you have many different topics to talk, but I would like to start the, the discussion asking you what profile of patient with metastatic melanoma do you believe should be a good candidate for surgery? Well, I think that, as we talked about this morning, that conversation is changing rapidly. And the, the, the indications to select patients with, with uh, metastatic melanoma for surgery are, are are evolving very rapidly. We now have uh, two effe very effective street treatment strategies, and how these interact with surgical resection in patients at very high risk for recurrence are, is, is, is evolving. I think at Memorial Sloan Kettering, when we have patients who have potentially resectable metastatic or recurrent melanoma, who after resection would be at very high risk for recurrence, are being considered for neoadjuvant therapy, either targeted therapy for RAF mutated patients or immunotherapy, if we have the time to develop an immunologic response. In, in Brazil, we do not have so many options in the field of neoadjuvant therapy. And normally we try to do the surgery when the patient has a long time since the diagnosis and the, the recurrence. Do you believe that in this approach, we can bring any damage to the patient in waiting for the next metastasis? No, I think the, the, you know, the well-worn pathway or the standard treatment pathway of surgical resection for metastatic melanoma, particularly for people who've had a very long disease-free interval, have one site of disease in one organ, uh, that's still quite valid. We have no sense right now that our uh, this theoretical approach of neoadjuvant therapy is superior to that. Uh, certainly, uh, the, those patients who are resected and even the most favorable ones are at high risk for recurrence. But I have no sense that uh, this approach of neoadjuvant therapy is superior to that. Uh, I do think there are a lot of advantages to neoadjuvant therapy. We can watch the response and make a decision about whether to continue it afterwards and uh, base a decision about whether to continue it afterwards on, uh, on whether the patient responds. We, it, we also, it gives us a little time to, to see whether the recurrence that we are seeing is the first and only recurrence or the first of many recurrences. And clearly yes. that means a lot for both of us. Yes, and how do you keep track regarding the best time to perform the surgery? Like, when you send a patient to the clinical oncologist, probably they are going to keep treating the patient. When do you know that is the right time to perform the <laughs> surgery? That's a great question. Yeah, I, I think there are lots of different answers to that, but probably the best one is that we all, we both continue to see these patients together as they're being treated, uh, so that the decision does not default to one camp or another. Um, I, I think one of, the, one of the greatest parts about this, the, the evolution of effective systemic therapies is that we now work together more than ever to try to individualize the treatment for each patient. Um, we don't know what the best time to, respond, uh, to, uh, to uh, intervene with local therapy is. We, don't, we, we generally use the strategy of treating to best response. But as you know, that could be, that's not an easy t thing to ascertain in patients, particularly on yeah. immunotherapy, where tumors might grow before they shrink. And what do you think about, uh, how can you comment the cases when the patient receives the immunotherapy and they have many lesions that are responding and one or two lesions are increasing? And 
probably this uh, clonal escape that could be candidate for surgery, but how do you decide which patients and which lesions? Yeah, another <laughs> great question. Um, these are all, uh, I think, answers in evolution. Um, but in a patient who we might consider for surgical resection if they did not have other sites of disease, and the other sites of disease are controlled or controllable, in other words, they seem to have reached a a, uh, a point of maximum response, those are the patients that we might consider for resection of the escape lesions. Um, we're, not, we're trying not to break all of the rules at the same time. <laughs> yes. The interesting thing is that if you have a patient who had uh, multiple sites of disease and they've been treated and they've responded and there is an escape lesion, a clonal escape, um, if you biopsy or resect one of the sites of disease that's, that, are, that is controlled and evident on scanning, it may not represent melanoma. It may represent treated disease, scar. And so I think there is value in, in, in resecting these escape lesions, but at the same time trying to get as much information as you can about the non-resected lesions or the other lesions. Yeah. Okay, and another question that in Brazil we have many patients with in transit metastasis, and these are challenging because most of these patients, they, they have many lesions all over the world, but you cannot see at that time. Then a lot of clinicals push us to perform surgeries, but yes. we know since the beginning that we are not <laughs> going to help so much this patient. Yeah. Do you have any experience with the local treatments like TVEC or PV10 in this kind of patient? We have, uh, we have a, a very strong program in regional recurrence, something we didn't have time to talk about this morning, but it's again another great question. Um, if you resect an apparent solitary regional recurrence, there's a 90% chance that we will fail and a 10% chance we will succeed. And this concept of when do we apply local therapy uh, when do we apply regional therapy or when systemic therapy is all based on that risk of recurrence after surgical resection. We believe that if it's, there's a solitary site of disease, that surgical resection is the most certain way to, to deal with it, recognizing that it's very unlikely to be the only successful treatment. We, I think most of the local injection therapies are very similar. TVEC is the new, new kid on the block. <laughs> but I think many of the older treatments, and this would include interferon, uh, this would include IL-2, this would include BCG, mm -hmm. yes. and actually it would also include a very old chemical substance called dinitrochlorobenzene or mm -hmm. DNCB. I think you can inject almost anything into local tumors and to get an inflammatory response that will, uh, that, that will show response in the injected lesion and occasionally in remote lesions. I'm not sure where we're going with injection therapy right now uh, as a solitary means of treatment, but mm -hmm. possibly in conjunction with some of these checkpoint blockade agents, uh, we may start to see something more. Um, I think one of the really interesting strategies that's evolving is combining regional infusion chemotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapy, in the same way that we've been doing it for decades, mm -hmm. with checkpoint blockade so that we see both a, a, a regional response but recognize that these patients are at systemic risk as well. So that's where I think the, most of the research is going. We've, we've got some very interesting results with regional infusion therapy and, and ipilimumab, and, and I expect that the next generation of studies will be, the, it, it will be regional therapy with the PD-1 blockade agents. Okay. And about a uh, limb perfusion or limb infusion, do you believe this uh, dead therapy or is, is there still a space for them? No, no, no. I don't think that regional therapy is dead. I think there are, uh, uh, there are some unique anatomic aspects of some melanoma occurrences that could take advantage of regional therapy. Um, the, the regional therapy clearly elicits a very high regional response. It's kind of like radiation. <laughs> yes. It does. It only treats what the area yeah, that's being help treated, a lot the patient and it doesn't that help time. the rest of the body. And so I think, and this has been our experience: is that the uh, uh, the few complete responders are, are in the limb are quite likely to recur elsewhere in the body. So 
I think the strategy of combining uh, treatments is, is the next generation of, of uh, treatment. And this is regional therapy with systemic immunotherapy. It may be, and we talked a little bit this morning about induction therapy with, with targeted therapy followed by long-term maintenance or therapy with immunotherapy. I think there are lots of combinations. And, and the, the interaction between cytotoxic chemotherapy and immunotherapy, I think, is one that we've only just begun challenges. to scratch the surface. Yeah. 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 Changing a little bit the subject, you is probably the person with the highest experience in the world in the following patients with positive sentinel lymph node. And which message would you like to leave to <laughs> the Brazilian surgeons <laughs> to deal with a uh, Positive sentinel lymph node. Right. I think that's a that's a fascinating question, and I really deeply believe that the uh, that the compass is swinging away from routine completion lymph node dissection. Uh, we have had a growing experience with with very close uh, observation of the nodal basin of patients with positive sentinel nodes. Uh, reserving lymph node dissection for those patients who fail in the lymph node basin only without and, and who do not develop disease outside of the lymph node basin. And we have not been disappointed in that approach. We have not ever lost control of the regional nodal basin by observation, and we've watched over 200 patients now. Um, and, but more interestingly, in those patients who've recurred in the nodal basin only and go on to lymph node dissection, uh, at present, we have about 20, 18 or 20 of those patients, and they have about an 80% survival. So they have really self-selected them. They, they've self-selected themselves, or they've selected okay. themselves, f as to be the ones who have what we call nodotrophic melanoma, yes. lymph node disease only, who are likely to benefit from yes. lymph node surgery. This is, uh, this is using time as your ally and helping you decide who should have this operation. So I'm not sure that we would say no one needs a, lymph, a completion lymph node dissection. What I think I would say is the time to make that decision is not okay. at the time of sentinel lymph node biopsy. And that's quite different from our current treatment pathway. Uh, so what would I tell the Brazilian surgeons? Uh, the same as I would tell the American surgeons, and that is this is not a knee-jerk reaction. This is a discussion a thoughtful discussion about the pros and cons of completion lymph node dissection. It's very clear there's about an uh, 18, 15 to 18 percent chance of additional positive nodes. Those nodes are found on less <coughs> rigorous yes. patho yes. pathologic evaluation. Um, but it's not clear that those additional nodes, apart from being highly relevant prognostically, uh, govern prognosis, govern outcome. And that's, yeah. that, I think, is important. And probably we are creating a new profile of patient because most of the adjuvant treatments were test, test, tested in patients that had the lymph node dissection. Yes. Then if you have a patient that were uh, sentinel lymph node positive and didn't do the radical lymph node dissection, we do not have experience in the sense of the risk of this patient, do you offer something in the adjuvant setting? Because even the new uh, clinical trials, they are not contemplating this kind of patients. I, I think the question of who should get adjuvant therapy and at what cost, and I don't mean just financial cost, but toxicity, is again an evolving question. What's the best endpoint for a clinical trial of adjuvant therapy? Is it relapse-free survival, which is a hard hard figure to ascertain, but is probably the purest evaluation of the impact of adjuvant yes. therapy, or is it overall survival, which reflects both the adjuvant therapy and the salvage therapy? And, and, and throughout melanoma, I don't think we have solved the overall survival question. We've seen interferon, which initially had some impact in relapse-free survival, but not overall survival. And most recently, we've seen two new, new agents, uh, it, um, biochemotherapy and now very high-dose ipilimumab, uh, that show about the same relapse-free survival advantage as interferon at substantially more toxicity. Your question about who should get, who should be exposed to this is quite relevant. And I come back to the question that I posed to the audience this morning. 
what is our threshold of risk to, that we would agree on is sufficient to expose patients to this yes. <coughs> expense, this greater yes. cost of treatment? They're mainly asking who we are treating, the anxiety yes. of yeah. the family and the patient yes. or really to look to bring some benefits for the, for the patient. Right. And another important question that in Brazil, they, uh, we do not have yet any PD-1 approved. Right. <coughs> it's an important concern, the question of money. And I see that we do not have yet even the standard treatment in the rest of the world. We are discussing combinations, following right. treatment. How do you, do, what's your opinion, the concern about the cost of treating a melanoma patient nowadays? The cost of treating a melanoma patient has gone up dramatically with the advent of all of these new treatments. Uh, and that's something we're going to have to wrestle with. We've never done it very effectively in any cancer, and we've certainly not done it very effectively in America. Uh, yes. And yet we are, it is a matter of increasing concern as we see these very high cost drugs. PD-1, I think, is, is going to be the test case because PD-1 uh, seems to be effective not only in melanoma, but, an, almost, but, but a number of other cancers it's been tried in, <clears throat> including renal cell cancer and lung cancer most recently. So we're going to have to confront this issue. It will not be the case that PD-1 drugs, the anti-PD-1 drugs will not be available in Brazil. They have to be, yeah. they are effective. But by the same token, they have to be made affordable. And that's, uh, that's going to be a, a, a long and careful negotiation, I'm sure. I have the impression that probably it's happening in Brazil and many other countries, is that the authorities were thinking about approving PD-1 for melanoma. But when they realize that PD-1 is going to work to many other <laughs> different tumors, yeah. they were worried about the cost of opening this door. Right. But I see this as, as not a problem, but an opportunity, because you are bringing over, increasing overall survival. And this is my next question. Uh, how many patients do you believe that are really going to achieve the cure with the immunotherapy? Because this is what all the cancer patients look for, even right. if they do not have this chance. Right. Um, I, well, I think the answer for ipilimumab is clear. I think it's about 20%. Uh, and we now have long-term data on patients who've received ipilimumab on clinical trials. Um, and that's a relatively unselected group of patients uh, with metastatic melanoma. They don't require gene mutations, they, they're just treated. And about 20% of all patients treated with, with ipilimumab have long-term survival. Um, very few patients treated with targeted therapy have long-term survival. We, and, and we don't know the answer for the PD-1 drugs yet. Um, so I think what you're at, at, one of the questions you're asking me is, is PD-1 gonna be different? Uh, and I don't know. We're seeing more responses, we're seeing them earlier uh, but whether they will last is, some, is a matter of quite some uh, concern. The other part of that, though, is how long should they be treated? And as you know, yes. with the... I saw that case. <laughs> that I'd like you to talk a little bit with that one shot yeah. case. And we really don't know how long to treat with, ipilimit, with uh, the PD-1 drugs. We treat to, uh, to toxicity. Uh, we've treated to best response. How, uh, if patient has a complete response, does that need to be maintained with ongoing ipilimumab or with ongoing PD-1 drug? We don't know that, and I expect there will be trials, as there were trials in yes. virtually every other cancer, uh, proving that uh, looking at varying intervals of treatment, uh, because I don't think we're going to be able to, de to define that with anecdote. It's particularly important in the case of the, uh, the PD-1 drugs because of the financial cost. Uh, they're, they're relatively tolerable, yes. but they're, they're, they're financially crippling. Yes, is what I used to say to Brazilian authorities, is something like this. If you are complaining about the cost of the treatments to treat uh, metastatic patients, helping, uh, help us to make early diagnosis and, and be able to cure the patients at an early stage with surgery. Yeah. But there is nothing new in the <laughs> last years. Do you see or predict something that could help us to, because 
in the last years, melanoma was not a concern yes. because when it's not expensive, the authorities do not look right. at the... They don't care. This, they don't care. <laughs> now they care a lot yeah. and probably they are going to push money to... Yeah. Do you see any new approach or something new that you can use? Yeah. So if I were a billionaire and I <laughs> wanted to answer that question, I would put all of my resources behind defining biomarkers that are predictive of response. And in fact, that's what a lot of the, uh, a lot of the melanoma research support organizations have done in America. They're not, they're supporting basic science research, but they're really supporting the development of biomarkers that will predict response to these expensive drugs for two reasons, for three reasons. Find the people who will respond, but more importantly, find the people who will have no chance of responding uh, because there's no sense in, in, in treating them. I think this is what's behind the targeted therapy, the biomarkers, the RAF mutation, uh, as you know, we've tried to look at immune, immune, immune uh, Profile, mutation profiles yeah, for ipilimumab. It's not all or none. The biomarker of pdl one expression is not perfect. Uh, it's good, but probably not good enough to discriminate who should or should not get the PD-1 drugs. But the, the holy grail of systemic treatment for melanoma at this point is biomarkers. biomarkers. Yeah, there's no question about that. Okay, yeah. we are going to end this discussion. I'd like to thank you very much, Professor Daniel Cote, and I'd like to ask him to do the closing remarks. Well, uh, I, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to participate today. Uh, it's been a real treat for me. I've learned a huge amount. Um, we all sense the excitement in the field of melanoma right now. Uh, we're asking new questions, we're having different conversations with patients, and we're, we're observing uh, miracles uh, more than just anecdotally. Uh, it, it, my, my sincerest wish is that I could start all over again in the field and, and, and grow with this incredible excitement and synergy of the medical oncologists yes. and the surgeons. Uh, it's been a it, it's been an enormous privilege to work with the group at Sloan Kettering, yes. uh, the Walchuk and Chapmans, who have really led uh, some of the, these changes that have affected patients worldwide. And, and it's a, it's been a tremendous tremendous privilege to be able to share my opinions with you today. Thank you. I believe there is who can say that there is hope for the patients with melanoma. And there is a space for all kind of doctors that who want to study and deal with melanoma there, there patients. Is, there is real hope. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.